il senso religioso o l'esperienza religiosa è innanzitutto un fatto un fenomeno obiettivo un fatto reale non è un'idea innanzitutto non è un modo di sentire non solo si tratta di un fatto di un avvenimento ma del fatto più imponente e più inestirpabile della storia dell'uomo più imponente più vasto che neanche il fenomeno dell'amore dell'uomo e della donna che neanche il fenomeno del rapporto tra genitori e figli perché il senso religioso è un avvenimento che pone che afferma o che ricerca l'orizzonte entro il quale acquisti senso anche il rapporto tra l'uomo e la donna anche il rapporto tra genitori e figli perciò è più vasto perfino di quelli
il senso religioso o l'esperienza religiosa è innanzitutto un fatto, un fenomeno obiettivo, un fatto reale, non è un'idea, innanzitutto non è un modo di sentire, non solo si tratta di un fatto, di un avvenimento, ma del fatto più imponente e più inestirpabile della storia dell'uomo. Più imponente, più vasto, che neanche il fenomeno dell'amore dell'uomo e della donna, che neanche il fenomeno del rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perché il senso religioso è un avvenimento che pone, che afferma o che ricerca l'orizzonte entro il quale acquisti senso anche il rapporto tra l'uomo e la donna, anche il rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perciò è più vasto, perfino di quelli. Quello che ti serve, quando ti serve. Come il piano Easy Smart a Canone Zero, anziché a 3,90 euro al mese. Easy Bank, semplicemente banca. serve quando ti serve. Nasce Easy Bank, la nuova banca digitale di Intesa San Paolo. Easy Bank, semplicemente banca. Il senso religioso o l'esperienza religiosa è innanzitutto un fatto, un fenomeno obiettivo, un fatto reale, non è un'idea. Innanzitutto non è un modo di sentire, non solo si tratta di un fatto, di un avvenimento, ma del fatto più imponente e più inestirpabile della storia dell'uomo. Più imponente, più vasto, che neanche il fenomeno dell'amore dell'uomo e della donna, che neanche il fenomeno del rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perché il senso religioso è un avvenimento che pone, che afferma o che ricerca l'orizzonte entro il quale acquisti senso anche il rapporto tra l'uomo e la donna, anche il rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perciò è più vasto perfino di quelli quello che ti serve quando ti serve Piano Easy Smart a canone zero, anziché a 3,90 euro al mese. Easy Bank, semplicemente banca.
quello che ti serve quando ti serve. Nasce Easy Bank, la nuova banca digitale di Intesa San Paolo. Easy Bank, semplicemente banca. La civiltà dell'amore, fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo.
Buonasera. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome. Algorithms are among us. The impact of uh, uh, new generation technologies, especially those uh, uh, created after the technological revolution, is very, very high. It's very significant. It concerns us all and all the aspects of life. Think about today. How many times uh, each one of you uh, has been on the smartphone, but not to make a phone call? but to uh, ask for a direction to come here and to park. Uh, you need the app in order to enter the fair. Uh, you have to, I had to download the QR code and then to book this uh, uh, meeting. And there's many of you who've done that. When we are moving, when we're reading, when we're writing, when we're buying something, when we're studying, short, when we have to uh, find information to think, to live, and to make decisions, we are uh, uh, actually resorting to systems, and uh, uh, we will uh, try to understand uh, what that means, artificial intelligence systems. Uh, We're asking them to uh, give us suggestions, uh, ideas. Now uh, we are slowly starting to uh, realize, but before that we didn't realize, that uh, we are uh, experiencing one of the most uh, significant uh, changes uh, since the ancient times. Today, technology is not asked to do for us something that we had already decided, maybe to do it more effectively. Today, Technology is asked by us to make decisions, and this is a shift, this is a change. We're not just asking technology to implement, to carry out something, to do something, but to think uh, what we have to think about something. Just imagine, in, if uh, uh, in the past uh, you, you wanted to understand what was happening at the meeting, um, you uh, did it on Google. You Google, and uh, there is a lot of information on that internet. Who is going to decide which is uh, uh, the uh, first uh, news, the first uh, two or three news that is given on the uh, internet, that is given on Google? And then it is uh, difficult uh, then to uh, uh, look for uh, uh, all the other uh, pages. You just uh, stick to the first uh, two pages. So who has uh, made a decision on that? Uh, who has decided for that? Who has decided among the thousands uh, uh, of news and information to show that information, that specific information? So this is the power of algorithms because especially when we are asking algorithms uh, uh, to make a decision for us, when we're asking these systems uh, to uh, make smart decisions, uh, we trust them. It means that we trust them. We decided to trust them. Undoubtedly, this very strong technological uh, development has led to uh, some anxiety and has risen concerns If we give some someone else our decision-making will, we are giving out our freedom. We are uh, entrusting someone, someone or something else uh, with our decisions. Hence this concern, hence this anxiety. Uh, and films uh, have uh, significantly increased this anxiety. Uh, think about Blade Runner, for example, which was the first film, the pioneer film, and then Terminator, Matrix, Robocop, Transformers. Uh, these are all very bad machines, I would say. So why have they been so successful? This, why, despite this concern, do we still uh, trust these machines? 
Well, there's a couple of reasons, in my opinion. First, this technology uh, has enabled us uh, to do very important things, very useful things. Uh, think about the pandemic, for example. Had we not had digital technologies, uh, many of the things that were stuck through the pandemic couldn't have been done. So, on the one hand, this technology is a giant leap forward. But then, these systems and uh, uh, these technologies are very uh, uh, practical, uh, are very effective. We can save time, we can save, uh, we can refrain from thinking, and they uh, uh, make our life easier. In so doing, they are conquering our trust. However, I think that uh, uh, there is uh, a third challenge, which maybe is even more uh, interesting. Uh, against this background, against this scenario, uh, where there is an increasing number of systems and machines, for the first time in history, uh, uh, we have machines and technological systems uh, 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 that want to perform well and even better than us, uh, what we used to do in the past, we human beings, that is. This is why uh, a question is raised. Is there any human dimension in that? Is there any human dimension that cannot be replicated by a machine, that cannot be uh, automated? The real challenge is to understand whether there is something pertaining to mankind, to humanity, that cannot be replicated. And these machines uh, are questioning us on that. So uh, these are really uh, uh, very important questions, uh, uh, key questions. This is why, in order to talk about that, we need to have uh, two distinguished guests up to the topic, up to the challenge, just like the two uh, speakers we have with us today, whom I really thank, I warmly thank for uh, accepting to come back to the meeting. To my left, uh, Father Paolo Benanti. Father Paolo, uh, Franciscan, and you can see that with your own eyes, he is a theologist, he is a professor at the uh, Gregorian University, and uh, 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 he is one of the uh, most important uh, intellectuals, uh, uh, most experts in the, fam in, in the field. He is a member of the task force of the artificial intelligence of the uh, Italian National Agency. He is a member of the Council of Europe. He is writing new rules on artificial intelligence, uh, and uh, the list would continue forever. However, the most important thing is that uh, he is one of the persons uh, that is uh, most expert in the field and uh, he is also um, able to communicate on this topic. So thank you very much for being here with us today. To my right, uh, you have Professor Nello Cristianini. Uh, he already came to the meeting in the past. Um, he's Italian. He's from uh, Gorizia, and he studied in Trieste University. Uh, he uh, is now uh, teaching in Bath in the UK. He also taught in Bristol. And Nello is uh, one of the most prominent experts and professors of artificial intelligence. Uh, he is a physicist by background, but he has always carried out research on these topics. He has recently uh, published a book, La Scorciatoia, The Shortcut, uh, uh, which uh, uh, focuses on the dissemination of uh, machines uh, in the social context. So we will discuss this topic uh, uh, with uh, these two distinguished speakers. So. 
We thought about the first round of questions uh, to start from the beginning, to start from uh, the phenomenon of artificial intelligence. So when talking about artificial intelligence, uh, when describing the impact that they have, what are we talking about? What is the origin uh, 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 of this phenomenon? How, to what extent are they disseminated? Father Paolo, the floor is yours. Thank you for your kind uh, introduction. Maybe I don't deserve it. Uh, and thank you for this opportunity to uh, be here once again at the meeting. Talking about artificial intelligence uh, means uh, talking uh, about a story that uh, started in a, in a seminar in the United States in the 1960s, uh, where uh, they uh, realized uh, that uh, there was a new characteristic of reality, not matter, not energy, but information. And uh, information uh, could uh, give us a new way to control machines. Shannon, the father of information, for, in for demonstration purposes, uh, had uh, uh, made uh, a small uh, a mouse, a tessius, uh, that uh, uh, a slapping on the walls uh, uh, of a maze uh, was changing direction and uh, uh, could find the way out from the maze. It was the first time that by uh, uh, using information, uh, a machine was not uh, just imitating the human muscle, but uh, was able to pursue an end which is a, a characteristic uh, that is related to some forms of intelligence, like, uh, for example, the uh, dog uh, that uh, can find a food in the house uh, is a smart. But this way of uh, using information uh, to control the machine uh, because uh, 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 the machine was uh, changing its behavior every time uh, it was uh, stumbling against the wall. That was uh, cybernetics. And my professor told me that university life uh, is paradise. Uh, the uh, uh, evil is your colleagues, he told me. Uh, because uh, 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 McCarthy uh, uh, called this new branch of discipline artificial intelligence. But uh, he uh, uh, didn't want to call it cybernetics, just like Binary. So in the mid-1960s, with uh, a name that nobody wanted but was better than others, we started to describe a new type of uh, machine that uh, find uh, the ways to uh, achieve the means. So I don't want to replace uh, um, uh, Nello because he knows uh, that much better than me, but I want to uh, talk about ethics. I want to uh, uh, show you what we have to pay attention to because a machine that has a means can find the ways on its own, but you understand that uh, uh, the means doesn't justify the ways. Hence, a major problem. So what are the most suitable means, uh, ways, uh, sorry, to achieve uh, some means? Winkelstein, uh, the philosopher, said that the borders of our world, of my world, are the borders of my language, uh, of my words. So for the first time, we had to use a term which we was mainly applied to uh, humans and to some animals to describe a machine that was built by man. But we were missing the words, which is part of the problem. In order to describe the difference between something working, as in the machine, and someone existing, me and you. So I don't have much time here to give an answer to a problem that has not been fully solved. However, I wonder whether maybe we can take something uh, from uh, our Western thoughts in order to describe this difference, uh, in order to uh, uh, understand what is this a form of intelligence which is not animal, which is not connected to animals nor humans. So let's go back to the classics. If you read uh, the Ulysses, the Odyssey, uh, Ulysses, uh, uh, 
in Greek uh, indicated uh, a form of uh, a different intelligence that was different from any other form of intelligence. Nous is a form of intelligence that understands, and then metis, a form of intelligence that can find solutions. So, if we had to understand what artificial intelligence is, artificial intelligence is a metis that can find solutions that is not different from any other form of intelligence now. And it is astonishing because it can find for us uh, some things that we would find it hard to find. So, artificial intelligence uh, uh, is not just one because, I mean, these are all machines that uh, inside uh, have some peculiarities uh, and uh, are somewhat related to human intelligence. So maybe the best thing uh, to do would be to call them artificial intelligences in plural, uh, because they do uh, s different things uh, and uh, uh, they carry out different tasks. So artificial intelligences uh, collect different tools, different instruments, which can be more or less powerful, which can use more or less energy, uh, enabling us to find a means to solve problems. It means that uh, an artificial intelligence is useful only uh, uh, if we have a problem to solve in practice. An existential uh, question is not a problem to solve. It's something different. And therefore, it's very humane and very little artificial. To conclude, I would like to uh, uh, focus on the last frontier of artificial intelligence that was in the headlines everywhere in the past few months, the, big, the major language models, better known as JetGPT. So this is the last frontier of artificial intelligence. In this case, uh, the machine should tell you what is the next word in a sentence, but it is so powerful that uh, it can uh, show all the paragraph and even all the page, not just one word. So these artificial in intelligences uh, are related uh, uh, to uh, um, the uh, uh, intelligence of the humans because since we are kids, we know that uh, those who, are, who tell us fairy tales uh, give us a certain pros prospect of the world. So what are artificial intelligences? They are uh, interfaces to uh, reality. Uh, uh, giving us the possibility to solve the problem uh, before us uh, and uh, uh, help us understand uh, what we have. It's like the lens that in the 16th century enabled us uh, to make the telescope and the microscope uh, with which we looked at the sky and uh, we understood something different, uh, with which we looked at our body and we understood ourselves. Uh, so the challenge is that today uh, the machine machine is helping us to understand about reality. So the problem, once again, is still the man and not the machine. So intelligence, intelligences, so how would you define these new technologies from the inside? Well. I always try to simplify things to help people understand because actually it's a complex issue. But we can, first of all, try to define what intelligence is in a more practical way. Let's look at biology. Well, until some years ago, we knew biological forms of intelligence in animals, for instance. So. Everything starts from there. So intelligence has been existing on the planet long before the existence of human beings. And uh, it has been existing before language and self-consciousness. So 
if this is the case, and it is, it means that it doesn't need language. So you can find that in original prehistoric animals, in oceans, in prey, in predators. There was even col collaboration or competition. So intelligence has always been there. Well, and intelligence has always been with us. And it's an ability, it's a skill. You can get it in so many different ways. There is no specific feature related to intelligence. Intelligence is to the ability to adapt, to learn, to make decisions in new situations. An animal in a brand new setting, of course, doesn't know how to behave in that new setting. It has to think over it, make calculations, and assess the situations, and so that's where intelligence comes into play. And today when you, for instance, uh, play at some games uh, like chess, uh, you need to understand uh, what to do. And uh, so a machine playing chess does the same. So let's not be distracted by the complexity of our intelligence that is pretty unique and different from anything else. And let's focus on what is crucial and essential. So. A chicken needs to cross uh, a road, uh, uh, needs some form of intelligence, much more than Shakespeare to write uh, a work of art. So, but that kind of intelligence, it's something that is not even exclusive to animals. Machines already have that uh, because we have uh, built machines that can self-learn through planning and assessing, and we have been using them long before ChatGPT. We have them in our pockets, for we have been having them for 10, 15 years. Well, when we watch a video on YouTube that uh, the machine uh, sort of proposes to us, the algorithm has made decisions. So out of a possible billion videos, the algorithm make a decision about a specific video. When you install, for instance, if you have TikTok, you know that uh, you create an account. And uh, when you register, you are a brand new user, then maybe you make some testing. You, and the algorithm trying to understand what you like, and then it reaches its goal, so that uh, I can just entertain myself by watching at videos. Amazon recommends uh, books, uh, and YouTube recommends videos, and so on. They are intelligent, smart uh, machines, but the real question is, they have a different intelligence, not the human intelligence, but how can we build them? This is interesting and important, because, of course, uh, we have John McCarthy, who named our sort of area of expertise and our research uh, AI. But what we're doing today would have surprised John McCarthy because he was expecting a completely different setting. I had the chance to get to know him. It's an incredible story. I didn't have the time to tell it now, but I had the chance to meet him and um, he named this domain and also he named the very first key ideas. So using explicit reasoning, grammatical rules and logical rules to develop all that. And we have invested so much in order to understand what language is, hoping to create something likely to reproduce it, but actually we didn't get any results there. But then we gave up to this idea and project and we thought, uh, let's try to shape language, at least statistically, as we can. And so we gave up uh, un understanding the essence of human language and we, I mean, uh, decided just to stick to somehow statistic based uh, sort of guesses and evaluations. And that approach has been working in many, many areas. So trying to preview, predict a video or a book. So it's a shortcut. So using statistics and not logical phenomena comprehension as a key tool. But then that raised another issue, how to gather data to let machines self-learn. 
And so instead of uh, producing those data, we decided to gather them from the internet. And this is the second shortcut. So we got the data from the internet in order to teach machines how to proceed. And then you understand what the the users wish instead of asking them we decided to watch what the users do and so observe their behaviors registering each decision each and single one so if you put together the three short gusts so statistics uh, data found online and the users uh, remarks so we have the three key components that make up uh, the recipe that uh, is applied by Amazon to YouTube to Facebook down to ChatGPT down to Google Translation. And again, that fixed some issues but created new issues because the machine does not represent the world, the world as we know it. It's deeply different from us. So it can understand a lot, but in a different way from us. I can't tell YouTube, okay, if you recommend that video to a minor, you risk to somehow encourage, well, things that should not be encouraged. And so another problem that we are watching uh, originates from these three shortcuts, and it won't be easy to fix it because we do not have another alternative technology. We just have the statistical methodology that can fix some issues but can create new ones. But these machines understand their way the world. Uh, Chat GPT is a form of intelligence, and it has a form of understanding. In Meaning by that to what I said at the beginning, so alien, non-human animals, or simple animals, it won't be easy to understand each other with these mechanisms because they do not think like we do. But now we need to coexist with them to sort of uh, do something about that. And this is exactly the project we're currently working on. Well, it's not easy at all to recap such complex issues in so little time, and they have been great in doing so, so wonderfully. So one thing is fixing the issue, and another thing is considering the kind of artificial intelligence that we can produce, and what about the relationship to intelligence knowledge? So, well. Why are then people so afraid? Why are we afraid? I mean, if these machines are good tools to fix a number of things, Paolo, why is it so that so many people are afraid and some people fear a much larger anthropological impact, especially also on our you know, cognitive skills, which are the risks and instead which are the pros? Again, wow, this is another great, great, great endeavor. It's not easy to answer in such little times to such this question. So as we heard, we have machines that not only can decide the ways to reach a certain objective, but also we have been given a machine that has a great, great power that is about predicting and forcing something that hasn't happened yet. If on the orbital station, we were to register all the data gathered by mobile sensors, we sort of may find here and there data that detach from, uh, you know, normality. When an air compressor starts uh, breaking the bearing, well, it starts vibrating more. So, the machine is looking for regularity and so it can acknowledge this anomaly and uh, turn this into a prediction of breakdown of maybe that component. So we may develop a system registering the anomalies of the vibration of a certain axle that will predict that that axle will break uh, in a certain amount of time. So, and again, let's imagine, for instance, being able to be 
in outer space and be able to fix something before it gets broken so that I can intervene beforehand. But this prediction power works pretty well on those data that are generated by mechanical systems. So system stats have almost no margin of maneuver. So, I mean, everything has been planned and decided by the engineer of the machine. But if we were to apply the same systems and shortcuts on data based on the chemistry of carbon, well, what then would happen? So we have a nice little defect called the freedom, and we have several levels of freedom so that a machine interacting with a human being not only can sometimes foresee what you're about to do, but also according to some studies, it seems to be able to predict part of our behavior, the marketing understood that a long time ago because maybe we pay attention to some messages. And so we have seen examples of predictions that have been generated 10 to 15 percent more. So having such tools of predicting behaviors is extremely useful, but also it can be extremely dangerous. And this is this is not just an issue of uh, technological, I mean, border. Well, 70,000 years ago, in a cave, we took uh, uh, a stick in our hands. Was that a weapon to kill more people? Or, I mean, uh, uh, was it something that we could use to kill an animal and uh, uh, eat it? So in uh, Gulag Archipelago, Sojenitsin said that the fine line between good and evil goes uh, right through the middle of our heart. So it's not a problem of power of algorithms. Let me play a little bit with the title of this meeting. The real problem is behind the algorithm because all that becomes society, becomes an organized system. So this is the ethics of technology. When in uh, eight in the eighty, London Wiener, uh, sort of uh, socially criticized technology, did it to throw an example. If you go to Manhattan, New York, you may see a beautiful six-lane uh, motorway connecting Manhattan with Long Island. And uh, a very famous New York-based politician, Richard Moses, made this kind of research. Because if you have a look at that uh, highway, you would see something very similar to any other motorway in the world. So uh, concrete uh, and uh, um, asphalt. And uh, Moses wrote a book, the non one of the 100 best non books. Moses had ideas that maybe today couldn't be accepted, but very clear ones. So according to him, the best part of the city had to be devoted to the best people. And Johnson Beach, the best New York beach, had to be reserved to the average white middle class. So no trains are designed, and the concrete bridges are 66 centimeters lower than the standard, so no buses and coaches can cross them, so only the people with a car could cross them. So each uh, a technological artifact has a social power and a social value, so it can be used as a power device, so a means of power. So again, when we talk about uh, pros and cons, uh, we need to do simply that. So consider now that technology and see which and kind of uh, power-based relationship and role they can play. And after the COVID, it's not just a matter of reinforced concrete. Uh, but today, well, the right to health has been uh, considered as uh, such uh, thanks also to what lies behind the algorithms. Uh, 
of uh, healthcare entities. So an algorithm doesn't tell us if something is good or bad. An algorithm helps us uh, ask ourselves questions, uh, seeing if uh, a certain kind of use uh, somehow can uh, deny or confirm or criticize uh, specific, uh, you know, phenomena of our society. To what extent uh, these uh, behavior prediction could be used for good things? Uh, the average age in Italy has been going up until 83 years of age. A recent statistic uh, study said that uh, we consider old people when uh, they reach 84 years of age or up. And well, over the last 55, 60 years, uh, people have been taking at least a couple of drugs, uh, a lot of medication. So this medication intake uh, can really bring about a longer lifespan. But then uh, if you have chronic disease and you forget uh, to take uh, that medication, then you go into a crisis, you go to the, emer the emergency, but the emergency is overcrowded, so you go back home and uh, your health gets worse and the quality of public health care systems uh, get worse. So again, this could be a great tool to help people for their therapies. Others could use it uh, to carry out uh, sort of impactful activities. And again, between uh, the good and the bad, the good and evil, it's up to us to make the decision what is what. Nello, one of the things that I'm most struck by uh, what you're writing is uh, uh, you are um, uh, uh, carrying out a lot of uh, research in this field, but uh, you uh, always know, uh, you are pretty much aware of the uh, positive and negative impacts of these technologies. What do you think about that? I believe uh, it is important to understand that uh, it is not easy to separate the technologies uh, from their use. There is, on the one hand, technology, on the other side, there is use. But we have also said that machines constantly need data. And in order to collect data, machines have to connect with us, have to observe us, and vice versa. The web uh, we have created could not be used uh, if uh, there were no efficient algorithms enabling us to find content. So just imagine a library with no catalog. You wouldn't uh, find a book. It's not easy if you don't have a catalog in a library. So YouTube has billions of videos, and it would be useless without an algorithm recommending them. This is quite important. We have created those uh, intelligent machines uh, uh, which can understand and forecast our uh, actions. And they have been put inside this digital infrastructure on which we depend a lot, and they are controlling. Uh, hence the power, as Paolo was saying, uh, they have a power because uh, the machine uh, is in a position to make a decision on what emails I'm going to see and what mails I'm not going to see, what news I'm going to read, what videos I'm going to watch. Uh, so we have uh, given our decisions uh, to the machine. The machine is now making decisions for us. And we have started to use algorithm even before understanding uh, their effects and their impacts. Machines are there, can uh, see, can uh, be fed with data, and can uh, influence behavior. That depends on the technology of uh, we have created, but there are also risks. 
algorithms have been put in a place where they can decide who can uh, take out a mortgage, who can't, who can read the newspaper, who can't. And this is the power of control. It's like the example of the bridge and the bus. If uh, that man, uh, I mean, that man created a bridge because uh, he wanted to select the people passing through the bridge. But uh, if he hadn't had a goal, the result would be the same. The intention, the willingness, the goal uh, is uh, important, uh, but just to some extent. Uh, if the bridge uh, is low, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, the cars uh, would be selected anyway, even with no intention. So uh, uh, these machines uh, make us uh, have an impact on, uh, on on our decisions, on our behavior, and they are uh, observing users, they are understanding the users, and then they are using them. If then there are some uh, side effects, uh, well, uh, this is possible, but we don't know them. In, in my book, I call them secondary effects. The first the primary effect uh, is to uh, increase the number of users and the number of clicks. And this can be absolutely measurable. This is something that the machine can obtain and the machine can achieve uh, its first goal. But then we uh, tend to think that there are uh, problems of uh, emotional well-being in users, in young people, a problem with themselves, a problem of uh, political radicalization, persuasion, and in marketing uh, too, and even in political marketing. Persuasion is very important because it affects our independence. The fact of looking at the same thing from two different perspectives. If you click, when I click, I'm telling the machine what I'm interested in. And the machine does everything possible to give me uh, some uh, contents which I'm going to approve. But then uh, uh, when I click, uh, I'm also revealing my weaknesses. And the machines are going to uh, exploit my weaknesses. So uh, serving and manipulating are not two different things. Uh, when I have to click 10 times because of the machine, because the machine has uh, uh, convinced me to do so, what is that? Is that manipulation? Is that control? What is it? We have not yet, we don't have the uh, uh, cultural tools to understand these problems in detail. And this is the emergency. Uh, do we have to make laws in the before understanding uh, the problem? Now there's going to be elections in Europe. There's going to be European elections. There's going to be elections in the U.S. and possibly in the U.K. And, and in addition to that, there is also uh, ChatGPT, which is a new entry. Now the machine is uh, speaking. Before that, the machine was just recommending, making decisions, but not speaking. Speaking creates an enormous emotional response. So since last November, uh, uh, we have been uh, paying a lot of attention because the machine is now speaking. If we start uh, receiving news from a system like GPT, there's a problem in terms of trust. Do we have to trust this information? Is this information neutral? Is this equal? And then, uh, in the past two years, for the past two years, machines have been able to produce uh, uh, realistic images, but they are synthetic images, artificial uh, images. Um, there are images with very uh, good quality. So there's a system that can uh, speak, that can generate images, generate videos, uh, answers questions, just like an oracle. And this is just uh, the first year of GPT. Uh, this is why I'm raising these concerns. Just imagine the airplane of the Wright uh, brothers in 1903 while he was uh, uh, starting to fly. And that was just the first tier. And now you have e EasyJet, Ryanair. Uh, you have uh, uh, a whole world uh, of airplane, airplanes. 
uh, depending on the evolution of that famous airplane in 20 years, uh, there's going to be uh, the 24th version of GPT, for example. What will it be like? So right now, we have to start to understand what it means living in a world, sharing a world with machines that have these kind of skills. In many cases, uh, I think that these machines would be even overhuman uh, with incredible skills that humans don't have. This is why we have to think about this in advance. I am convinced that we will manage to strike a balance, but right now uh, we are in turmoil, and this is why we are somewhat anxious, uh, worried, but uh, we don't have to be afraid. It wouldn't be right for us. But uh, we don't want to be anxious. We don't want to continue to be anxious. I really liked the image you used, the club uh, uh, could be used in prehistoric times, could be used in many different ways. So Nello, in technical terms, uh, uh, explained to us that we are at a turning point. So the title of the meeting of this year is uh, Existence is an Inexhaustible Friendship. Uh, there is something characterizing the existence of human beings. Since none of us thinks that we can live in a different world or that we want to live in a different world, what does it mean to save mankind? What does it mean to bear responsibility, to be responsible while using these tools today? You always have uh, eight minutes, impossible challenge as usual. I'm going to take on impossible challenges. Uh, I will give a technological answer. Uh, uh, we need a 3D friendship. So I'm going to note that down. So the first form of friendship that we need uh, is a friendship with ourselves. Once uh, in the human skeleton, uh, you could find the writing and know yourself. Uh, that was uh, uh, the mission of man. Uh, there, was some th there was something that was not enough. Uh, we had to go beyond. Then with Linnaeus, uh, something uh, happened. This sentence happened in the uh, Linnaeus uh, classification system. Uh, uh, deriving from the anatomical the theater, there was the name uh, of uh, uh, the, a monkey, Homo, and uh, a unique uh, characterization that they made us different from the rest uh, of the other monkeys, the uh, sapiens. So, now that we have made a sapiens machine, we don't have to uh, mm, just to be uh, uh, monkeys. And then uh, there is also a passion for mankind. The first form of friendship uh, that we need is a friendship for uh, people, for the person, for a uh, uh, fragile category in the West that has uh, become an empty category to some extent because speaking machines, as Nello was saying, uh, are quite strange. We've never seen them before. There is a language challenge day by day with a machine that is getting more and more human and a man that sees himself as a machine day by day. If we look at the way we're studying our emotions, our freedoms, uh, our emotions are called algorithms now, now uh, because the monkey on the tree does not make a decision because it's calculating whether he has to make a banana uh, or he has to defend from the lion, either he's brave or not. Uh, so that also becomes a biological algorithm. So the first form of friendship, uh, the first dimension of friendship is with ourselves. The friendship with man, the person. And this is a sense of uh, uh, continuous unsatisfaction. The second form of friendship uh, is uh, 
uh, a, a friendship between the different disciplines, uh, constitutional law, physics, IT, uh, physics, uh, technologies. We have to go uh, back uh, to talk among us. Uh, to have a dialogue. Talking about artificial intelligence does not mean just talking about one single discipline. There are different sociological, technical, psychological, social uh, uh, skills. What this is happening on uh, the newborns. Uh, we don't know uh, the impacts of these machines uh, on the newborn babies. How uh, will they make the decisions in the future? We don't know that. So we need a friendship among us. And then the third form of friendship is uh, friendships among generations, looking at the future, but also looking at the past. Because the most fragile people today are the two extremes of the spectrum, the youth and the elderly. If we want to develop these tools, uh, only by thinking that those who are in the center, those who already have uh, antibodies, so to speak, in order to manage this change, uh, we are creating people that will be marginalized. Where we will say that some lives are less important than others. Hence, uh, intergenerational uh, uh, friendship. We have to look at our youth. Uh, we have to promote education. We have to focus on the idea that the youth in front of us will be the men and women of the future. Antoine Saint Exupery. Uh, in a book that is uh, uh, not very uh, uh, very well known, which is called uh, Terra degli Uomini, Land of the Man, where he told about his experience as pilot. And he came back by train uh, from France to Germany one night, and he saw on the train many Polish miners going back home to their families. And uh, these men were bending down uh, because of the harshness of their uh, hard work in the mines. And they have with them their wonderful kids, blonde. And they think he thinks they are like the roses of a garden. Who is going to take care of these roses so that they will not bend down in life like their parents? This is the passion that we must have. This is the friendship that we must have. Uh, otherwise, uh, we will consume what we need without caring for tomorrow. And then this friendship must also become certainty. We have to tame these technologies to democracy. We Europeans know that in the 20th century, the world wars have taught us that democracy is not perfect, but is the only way to control things that could not be controlled in the future. So since we have such powerful technologies and there are very few companies producing them, there are just nine companies, only nine companies producing these technologies, we needed to tame these technologies and these machines to a democracy. And this can only be done if we are friends among us. Thank you. Hello. Nello, the same question to you. Well, I'm very happy about this question because, well, I would have liked to tell you how machines have become uh, overhuman. Well, but actually, I decided to tell you something else now. When you can read that in my book, I mean, I want to say something else because this is much more important. When uh, you entrust machines with the role of mediators because this is what machines do because they have become mediators in human relations. They make decisions for us. They decide who is going to meet whom. Well, this is a kind of serious kind of power. They can define many, many important things. They say, I would like to underscore four key words because these are smart mediators. We're not talking about uh, well mediators with bad intentions. Well, we are talking about things that are brand new to all of us, uh, but we can still fix them. First of all, we are adopting the point of view of a mechanism. When we talk about the users, we 
we do not we do not even say people we say the word users so we're all considered as users first and foremost and not people that's alarming and then content so the content of uh, this beautiful exhibition on words has become a content but i mean is it what is content usually we talk about content when there is a container but is wine to be defined as a content and then friends on facebook we have uh, well we have friends but on facebook you don't have friends you have contacts and again it's a change so how many friends do you have but actually they are named as contacts and what about the friends that are not on Facebook? So again, this concept has been named differently. And then the online communities, those who like a certain singer, they're defined as a community of that. But a community is something different. What I saw here is a community. So the content, what well, content is a word that has been again changed. So we should first and foremost go back to you know, in-person relations, use words in their original meaning and do not use words the way machines tell us to do. And also, I would like to take another minute to totally share what Paolo said because the most vulnerable ones are the most important ones now, because there are many people who will get huge advantages from this revolution, and we, we want that to happen. But there are people who cannot follow that because maybe they are too old or not able, or are children that they that have full trust in their parents, but parents give them an iPad. And uh, parents should trust the company making that product. It is up to us to make laws now regulating all this, understand how to educate, understand how to check on this, how to survey. Well, the phenomenon is big and maybe we're not ready, but now it's up to us to let parents be able to have trust and tell their children you can have trust. And the same for the elderly who are also very vulnerable. Thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Well, I really thank Paolo Benanti, Father Paolo Benanti and Professor Cristianini because I think they helped us a lot, or at least they helped me a lot, better understand this phenomenon because the evolution we're all facing, these bigger and bigger, you know, use of uh, technological devices cannot generate a form of a rejection. I mean, we, we can't ban or we can't live without these things. We, so we, we try to cope with that, but how? And I think that what they said somehow raises the topic of uh, our responsibility. And we need maybe to be taken back to our own uh, responsibilities. So we have understood that we need to consider that. And these two experts know a lot about what they're talking about. They're really two specialists. So I would really like to thank them because not only they were so open and kind to come to us, and uh, talk about these important topics, but also I'm grateful to them because they made a real connection to this phenomenon and the reality we all live in. And uh, I like to go back to the beginning, the question I started with. So is there something that is s specifically and uniquely human, something that is re irreductible, it can't be placed, never ever, something that is typical human 
and that no machine will ever be able to replace. So these machines have been invented to find solutions, to find answers, because these kind of intelligence produces answers. That is why maybe the real human resistance lies in the questions, the ability to ask questions, because the human heart is a set of needs, of questions. Why is it so that, I mean, if I look at the beautiful mountain and I think about the ultimate, the, the ultimate meaning of life, or maybe uh, I think about God, so this is something that I have the impression belongs only to men and women, and that's what we need to preserve. And uh, this goes through education. I mean, we should sort of always never forget the importance of generating such questions. And then freedom. Paolo mentioned this word so many times. You said that these machines are obsessed with regularity. So freedom means what is unpredictable. So hard questions and freedom. And even two friendships are those that continuously raise questions and are based on freedom. So again, I thank once again uh, Father Paolo Benanti and Professor Cristianini for helping us better understanding the reality surrounding us. And also, well, I would like to remind you that the meeting is based on your contribution. So when you see the Red Heart donate now, well, it's not just part uh, of, uh, you know, the nice setting, but it's important because we rely on you, your contributions to keep the meeting alive. Thank you very much and goodbye. civiltà dell'amore, fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo. religioso o l'esperienza religiosa è innanzitutto un fatto, un fenomeno obiettivo, un fatto reale, non è un'idea, innanzitutto non è un modo di sentire, non solo si tratta di un fatto, di un avvenimento, ma del fatto più imponente e più inestirpabile della storia dell'uomo. Più imponente, più vasto, che neanche il fenomeno dell'amore dell'uomo e della donna, che neanche il fenomeno del rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perché il senso religioso è un avvenimento che pone, che afferma o che ricerca l'orizzonte entro il quale acquisti senso anche il rapporto tra l'uomo e la donna, anche il rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perciò è più vasto, perfino di quelli.
quello che ti serve quando ti serve. Come il piano Easy Smart a Canone Zero anziché a 3,90 euro al mese. Easy Bank, semplicemente banca. Quello che ti serve quando ti serve. Nasce Easy Bank, la nuova banca digitale di Intesa San Paolo. Easy Bank, semplicemente banca.